Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Rainbow Tree Care. My name is Sean Burnick and today we're going to be speaking on soil applied insecticides and their use in the tree care industry. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I've been with the company for 12 years and my focus within the company has been on our research, product development, and technical support on our different products and equipment. And it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today on this topic. Uh, I've got a lot of experience over the past, uh, oh, 10 years or so primarily working on soil applied insecticides, uh, working to uh, develop solutions for different insect pests with soil applications as well as other products uh, and treatment methods. And so this is a, an a opportunity for me to talk about some of my experiences and how these technologies can be utilized in the Arborist Practitioner's Toolbox. A few housekeeping items before we start the presentation today. This webinar is worth one CEU for ISA, for those of you seeking uh, ISA CEU credits. Um, and if you didn't enter your ISA certification number during registration, you have an opportunity now to enter it into the questions box, which is part of your uh, toolbar on the panel that I've got uh, cut out to the right here. Just enter it right into that question box there. Furthermore, we encourage as many questions as uh, you feel uh, to, to present to me today. Please enter those questions into the box and we'll address them at the end of the webinar as well. We'll try to leave a good 10, 15 minutes or so at the end for questions. Um, and I'll continue answering questions up until the end of the webinar and after if people want to stay on and listen. Also, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available afterwards for any of your coworkers within your company or organization. Or if you uh, find value from this webinar, please send that on to other people within the industry to go to our website and listen to uh, the webinar. Um, let's dig into the presentation. So today's overview for the presentation, we're going to talk about, in general, different tree care application techniques for applying uh, insecticides to manage different insects on trees. And then I want to touch on factors that influence the uptake uh, and transport of soil applied products, things that you need to be aware of uh, as a practitioner, and then discuss different application techniques and methods that we can apply these uh, products to the soil and some of the key distinctions for success. And then for the last third of the presentation, we'll talk about some of the specific soil applied insecticides that Rainbow works with and can provide to you uh, some of the specific insect management protocols. If we look at, in general, the ways in which we can apply different uh, products to trees, they really fall into two different categories. We have our systemic treatments and then we have our non-systemic treatments. And systemic treatments are those products that we can apply to uh, the tree as a tree injection treatment where they're applied directly into the xylem. You feel a series of holes in the root layers of the tree. And with different micro or macro injection uh, techniques, we can, in, we can introduce uh, products directly into the xylem string of the tree where they're systemically transported uh, into the tree. We can also systemically treat trees using soil applications, which will be the focus of our presentation today. Uh, two categories within our soil applications. We have the soil drench method and the soil injection method. And then a third way of doing systemic applications to trees, which has been more recently uh, introduced to the market uh, over the last 10 years or so, is to apply different active ingredients uh, to the lower five or six feet of the trunk of the tree to the bark and the treatments will move in through the lenticels to systemically be transported up into the tree to protect the crown and leaves. Non-systemic applications which include our foliar sprays, if we got different leaf feeding insects or foliar diseases we can apply a spray to protect the leaves and then we also have trunk and limb sprays uh, that can be applied to protect uh, from wood boring insects as a prophylactic spray to prevent uh, larvae from hatching in and feeding on trees or adults from, from feeding on trees. So those are the different ways in which uh, products are applied to trees uh, in our industry. 
as I mentioned today, the focus is on soil applied products in arboriculture. And soil applied products have, have been around and this te techniques have been around since the 40s when we started introducing uh, soil applied fertilizers to the base of trees uh, and doing that in a water soluble formulation and taking high pressure soil injection systems and applying products uh, right at the base of the tree as well as out in the drip line of the tree. Um, and so that was the first soil applied treatments that were applied to trees. And then also we have uh, additional treatments today that are applied as soil amendments, whether it's mycorrhizae or biostimulants. Um, tree growth regulators in the last 20, 25 years uh, have also been developed for application to the soil. Uh, we don't have as many fungicide formulations that can be applied to the soil and systemically taken up. There's only uh, a few on the market that we apply to the soil. Uh, with insecticides, though, there are a number of active ingredients that we can apply to the soil that are formulated to be taken up, absorbed by roots and taken up into the tree. If we look at the advantages of soil applications, uh, certainly, especially with uh, insects and insect management, these treatments really revolutionize the way in which arborists can treat large trees in the urban landscape. These products are systemic, so they can be taken up by the root system to protect the up above ground portion of trees. And even when you get into very large, 100 foot tall trees can be protected uh, with these systemic soil applications. Uh, furthermore, the applications, because they are systemic, and if you apply them correctly, you can achieve very uniform coverage up in the crowns of these larger trees. Soil applications are very quick. Whether you're doing soil injection or basal drench, you can completely treat a tree in a few minutes or less. And furthermore, the application techniques are very predictable. You aren't um, reliant on you know, if you've got windy days, you can go out and continue to make your soil applications, and even in light rain, continue to make soil applications. Whereas if you're doing sprays, uh, you have to time it around Mother Nature in some cases. And furthermore, if you look at the predictability of soil applications versus uh, systemic tree injection, where you're reliant on the uptake and the transpiration of the tree, these treatments, uh, again, don't take, are, are not as um, finicky because you're not reliant on that for the tree. They're non-invasive compared to tree injections, so you don't have to drill holes and make wounds in the tree. Uh, these soil application techniques, if you're doing soil injection or soil drench, are labeled for a lot of different active ingredients. So you can use the same equipment to make a lot of different treatments with different active ingredients. And you're not doing any spraying, so there's no drip involved with these soil applications. If we look at um, how they work on the tree, so these systemic applications are applied right at the base of the tree, typically with insecticides. They're absorbed by the roots and then transported in the sap stream up into the above ground parts of the tree. Uh, most systemic pesticides for tree care are mobile in the xylem tissue. There's only a few systemic treatments that are flow mobile, and none that I'm aware of as it relates to insecticides. There's some phosphite fungicides that can move both in the phloem and the xylem when applied systemically. Uh, however, our insecticides are, for the most part, to my knowledge, all uh, move in the xylem tissues. Upstream. Uh, that will certainly impact systemic uptake by trees that I'll touch on today. And I think it's important that you recognize some of these because they can impact the speed at which products will be absorbed and move into the tree. And also, in some cases, uh, the application timing when the products need to be applied. And also, there could be supplemental uh, requirements such as irrigation and other things that you as a practitioner can do to enhance the uptake and movements of some of these systemically applied treatments. First of all, there's some environmental conditions such as temperature, humidity, that will impact uh, transpiration on trees. The tree species itself, whether they're ring forest, diffuse forest, or they have tracheids like inner conifers, 
time of year and the growth rate is going to impact the transpiration, the size of the tree, the health of the tree, and certainly the soil moisture. In addition, one thing that I did not include on this list, uh, but the active ingredients in the formulation certainly will impact how quickly it moves into the tree and is transported into the tree. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on when we get into some of the specific active ingredients and their properties. So let's first look at tree species and how the species of tree that you're treating can influence water uptake. So within this um, chart here, you can see that it's the speed of xylem transport, what we're looking at in feet per hour. And then you have different tree species along the x-axis. Um, ring forest species, which have very large early spring wood vessels like our oaks, our ash, hickories, and then elms. And then diffuse forest species like walnut, willow, poplar, maple, and a few others that are listed there, and then the non-porous species that have trachids like our pines, hemlocks. And if you look at the difference in the speed at which water moves in feet per hour in, say, a red oak, which is about 90 feet per hour, 85 to 90 feet per hour, compared to a diffuse forest species like a maple, which is under 10 feet per hour, certainly you can see the impact on how quickly just water moves into trees. And so when we make a systemic application to the soil on ring forest trees, we would expect faster transport of those products uh, once they're absorbed into the root system on ring forest compared to diffuse forest and non-forest species. If you look at the time of year and how it can influence water uptake, this is a great uh, table that was taken from Fort Adel that shows the mean whole tree daily water use in hemlocks in two different regions of the country, one down in the southeast in North Carolina, which illustrates, and this is somewhat common sense, but as hemlocks begin to be uh, more active in the spring of the year and down in the southeast, this is going to occur earlier in the calendar season in February, uh, March, and April, you can see that their whole tree daily water use uh, peaks during those spring months and then drops off as we get into summer, um, fall, and winter. And so you can time some of these systemic soil applications to take advantage of that water uptake uh, in these trees. If you go into the northeast, up into Massachusetts, you'll see that uh, the mean water use starts to begin to increase as we get into April, May, June, and July. Common sense, but it also is something to uh, keep in mind when you're making soil applications. The other point that I'll mention around time of year is the phenology of the host in that uh, your transpiration is going to occur, of course, when trees are fully leafed out uh, and have their full complement of leaves uh, is when you're going to get greatest uh, transpiration and movements of the product up into the tree. So applications can be timed uh, to coincide or to, to be in the soil when that is occurring. Certainly tree size influences the uptake of water, and larger trees have more capillary flow. They're pulling in more water, and so with soil applications, um, it can certainly have an influence on how quickly products can move and be introduced into trees. Another um, key point around tree size is related to the dosage rates with our soil applied products. And as tree size increases, Certainly, we typically will make a recommendation to increase the dosage rates. And for some products, uh, you'll note that the dosage rate recommendations increase as size increases. So you want to follow those label recommendations uh, and make sure that you're applying the correct dosage rate for the size of the tree that you're working with. Another key influencer for water uptake with uh, trees and also something that can impact uh, how quickly soil applied products are absorbed by roots and move up into the tree as soil moisture. And this is something that I think we've gotten a really much better understanding of over the past, say, 10 years or so since emerald ash borer has been documented. And, and uh, something that emerald ash borer has provided us is with a lot of great research on different insecticides and how to optimize the techniques. Well, in looking at uh, our experience in working with uh, practitioners who have applied product, thermal ash borer, and other 
insects, especially in areas where there isn't irrigation, we have seen enhanced efficacy with treatments that are applied to soils that are irrigated. And furthermore, we've seen uh, years in which we've had drought, especially on municipal trees that are not irrigated. We can see that that has an impact on the effectiveness of some of these soil applied treatments. So one way to enhance the uptake of soil applications is to recommend your customers to keep their trees well watered uh, you know, prior to and uh, leading up to and after these systemic soil applications are made to enhance the uptake of the active ingredients, uh, the speed at which it moves into the tree, um, and, and also to just improve the condition of the tree overall. So soil moisture can certainly impact uh, you know, the efficacy of these treatments. And that's something we saw back in when we had a, a drought a few years back in the Midwest, as I mentioned, with municipal treatments from our ash borer, where the, the insecticides just weren't as effective during that season on some of these hard-to-grow urban areas that uh, were more droughty. And so take that into consideration. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the the common soil applied insecticides uh, that are used in the tree care industry, the different chemical classes. We have the organophosphates, which are older chemistries that were developed after World War II. The first soil applied insecticide that a lot of you might be familiar with is the Metasystox R. Uh, this was a product that was very effective, but certainly uh, was very broad spectrum and also was not the most user friendly active ingredient for applicators uh, given its toxicity. Um, further, uh, a little bit later on, acephate was developed, um, and that's an organophosphate that until recently was not labeled by the EPA for soil applications. And so that's a product that we'll be talking about a little bit later on um, in the presentation here. The neonicotinoid class of insecticides with the metaclopid first being developed in the late 80s, early 90s. This is really the class that I think uh, revolutionized the way in which arborists were able to treat trees systemically, very targeted applications at low dosage rates that could be applied out with um, metaclopid, and later on dinotephron, thiamethoxin, and protheanidin came out to the market. All of these can be soil applied. The, the two most widely used active ingredients in uh, the neonicotinoid class that are in the tree care industry are imidacloprid and dinotepuron. Uh, there is a new class of insecticides that uh, do have soil applications, at least chlorantronilipril, which is the trade name of Celeprin, uh, originally developed by DuPont, but now is a Syngenta uh, product. That has a very limited spectrum of insects that can be treated uh, using soil applications of the celeprin, lace bug, aphids, and then a couple other. Soil applications, if you look at uh, how these uh, products are applied via the soil, there's two techniques. Soil injection, and we uh, break that up into low volume soil injection treatments or high volume soil injection treatments. And the volume really refers to the amount of water carrier that we're applying with these injection systems and we're putting them into the soil. If you look at low volume systems, I've seen as low as one ounce of ready to use insecticide solution being mixed up and used with these soil applications. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the old curate system. That was a system that delivered one ounce of solution per inch of diameter to the tree. Rainbow has developed a specialized injection probe called the HTI-2000. And in this injection system, we're applying approximately eight ounces of mixed ready-to-use solution per inch of BBH. So that's, that is a relatively low volume of solution. Um, these soil injection systems, uh, the HTI can be hooked up to a backpack system or hooked up to a mounted to a truck on a PHD rig system, depending on the volume of trees that you're treating. Um, high volume systems, if you look at the amount of ready-to-use solution being applied per inch of diameter, I've seen it range from anywhere from a quart of mixed solution per inch of EVH up to a gallon 
per inch of DBH. And when you, I think the trend in the industry is to move more towards the low volume uh, soil injection application technique. Companies don't have to mix as much water and drive as much water around when they're doing their jobs. And it's more operationally efficient to apply lower water volumes. Um, the nice part about a lot of these soil applied insecticides is that there's flexibility in the amount of water that you apply. So you can do, use different injection systems that require different water amounts um, that you can use. Basal drench, two techniques. There's the surface drench where you apply it right at the base of the tree, you just drench it over the turf. Um, and there's also subsurface basal drench, which our company recommends, where you dig a small moat right at the base of the tree, and then you pour the product evenly around the root flares right at the base. Equipment that can be used, if you're looking at basal drench, you can mix most of these formulations up in a five-gallon pail and simply use that to make your drench application. Uh, or Rainbow has a basal drench kit that we offer that has a lot of the, the parts and components for mixing and uh, storing your water and applying the product um, is, is a, a way for some companies who like everything kitted up uh, for doing drench. And then you get into the specialized equipment with the soil injection systems. I would say that if you're a company that is going to be doing a high volume of soil applications, you might look at getting a, a soil injection system, whether it's a backpack system that's connected to a HDI 2000 like what we carry, um, or a system that hooks up to your spray rig. Uh, for your hydraulic spray rig, you can certainly, uh, with right, right connections, hook up a soil injection probe to that for making soil applications. The investment in the equipment uh, can very quickly pay off in the labor savings and time that you save when doing soil injection versus basal drench. Additional keys for success when making these soil application. Um, you'll note that on a lot of the older soil uh, applied labels for products that uh, they recommend either making the applications right at the base of the tree or making them uh, in a grid pattern out in the drip line of the tree. And you'll see that with the metacloprid and dinoteptyron and some of the other soil uh, labels that are out there. And those are still recommendations that are out there. Again, more of the recent research has shown that applications made right at the base of the tree can actually provide improved efficacy on things like emerald ash borer and other insects um, that are very difficult to control versus making applications out into the drip line of the tree. And really, if you look at uh, the two methods, basal soil and injection, when we're doing our soil injection, we recommend applying it within 18 inches of the trunk of the tree um, or right at the base with basal drench. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of fine roots that are great for absorbing these soil applied products right at the base of the tree. As you move further away from the trunk, if you were to apply the products in a grid pattern out of the drip line, <clears throat> you may or may not put those insecticides in the vicinity of a root that can absorb the product and take it up into the tree. And so I think if you're working with things uh, that are a little more easy to control, like aphids, um, sucking insects with a metacloprid or dinotethnuron, you're able to still get control. But as I mentioned in some of the more recent research with emerald ash borer, they found that applications right at the base of the tree were more effective than treatments applied out in the drip line. One other reason to do it as a, a company or as a, just as an, within your organization is that it's a lot faster to do treatments right at the base of the tree versus in the drip line. We found with our service company here in the Twin Cities that it's about 30% faster to make soil applications right at the base of the tree versus out in the drip line. Additional keys to success for soil injection, you want to make your injection sites to the mineral soil and you want to target a depth of about two to six inches. Place the injection sites evenly at the base of the tree, again within 18 inches of the trunk. And if you're treating smaller trees, you want to make at least four injection sites, one at each cardinal direction, so that you get uniform 
uptake and even distribution in the crown of the trees. It's extremely important when you're working with um, soil injection or, or any systemic treatments, your objective is really to get even uptake and uniform crown distribution. One thing I'll mention too with the soil injections is that with all of Rainbow's application guides, we've actually, for our HDI 2000, we've set it up so that the applicator applies one injection site per inch of DBH. And within the HDI, it has a handy little counter on there so that each injection cycle that, that you put for each site into the ground, it has a counter. So all really the applicator has to know is the diameter of the tree and um, and, and they will be able to determine how many injection sites they're going to apply. So a 20-inch tree, for example, would receive 20 injections at uh, 250 mils, or about 8 ounces per injection site, to fully treat that tree. For basal soil drench, uh, for doing the subsurface drench, the recommendation is to dig a, a small moat at the base of the tree, 2 to 4 inches wide, by again two to four inches deep or so and apply that to the mineral soil. Um, if you're working on a hill and you're doing basal drench, you want to make sure that you make some dams in your mulch so that the product again is applied evenly to the base of the soil. Apply the product uniformly around the base uh, and I'll typically recommend that applicators make a couple of um, uh, turns around the tree so they don't get halfway around the tree and all of your product mix is applied. So again, the objective is uh, to get even distribution in the crowns of these large trees. Um, allow the product then to uh, be absorbed by the soil, and then you can start to replace the soil over the top of it. And so again, a very targeted application that's made right at the base of the tree in uh, just a few minutes or less. <clears throat> A couple of additional keys, we mentioned targeting two to six inches deep in the mineral soil. It's really the mineral soil which is our target. So if you're working in landscapes where you've got mulch, landscape fabric, or a lot of duff right at the base of the tree, these products, will, and many of them, can tightly bind to that organic matter. And so you want to apply it to the mineral soil, uh, so you're targeting the root zone of where the roots are located in the tree. Um, and some things that if you're applying it to areas where there's rocks um, or other uh, mulches that, that are right at the base of the tree, you can either remove those, push those away before you make your application, or use a soil injection probe that gets you down beneath those mulch layers. One thing that uh, Michigan State, Dr. Dave Smitley had noted in some of the earlier with research on um, soil injection treatments, this was on bronze birch borer, was that in treatments where he made applications deeper than eight inches, so in this point, uh, particular study he actually made the treatments um, eight inches and uh, lower in the soil profile, he noted reduced efficacy. And so we want to be careful that we're not putting the application of these soil, soil treatments below where the majority of our roots are. Remember, the upper foot of soil is what we're targeting, um, where the root, or the upper foot of soil, excuse me, is where uh, the majority of our tree roots are at. And remember, these products, while they don't move up very significantly in soils with three two to three percent organic matter more, they will move some. And so, if you put it past eight inches or so, the uh, there's an opportunity for the product to move below where the vicinity of the majority of your roots are. And then also water the area thoroughly, especially during drought, uh, both to the days leading up to the application and immediately after. And with products that have a long residual in the soil, like imidacloprid, uh, sustained watering throughout the growing season is what can enhance the uptake and movement of these products as well. So those are some of the key uh, success factors when making systemic applications. Now let's talk about some of the commonly used active ingredients in the industry. And we're going to focus on the three that Rainbow has in our toolbox. These are widely used active ingredients. Uh, we'll talk about our dinoteptron formulation, which is our Transtech uh, 70 WSP. We'll talk about uh, our soil applied acephate, which is Lepitec, and then we have our two soil applied aminoclopid formulations, both a liquid formulation 
in a WSP formulation. With these three products, you can treat up to 90-95% of the insects that you deal with as an arborist. And so the spectrum of activity of these, um, each of them have their strengths. And we'll talk about the uses for, for each of these products. But with these technologies, you can treat everything from caterpillars to sucking insects, soft scales, a number of different armored scales, wood boring insects, um, and be very effective in using uh, these different treatments. As well as with Lepitec, the product, that product is actually effective on spider mites as well. So with these three tools in your toolbox, you've got a good opportunity to manage a lot of the common insects and even mites that you deal with. So let's talk first about um, the application methods for each of these. Um, with Zytec and Transtec, um, you can apply uh, Zytec as a soil injection, basal drench, or as a foliar spray. Um, in Transtec, you can actually also uh, treat that with uh, a basal systemic bark spray, as well as soil injection, soil drench, and as a foliar spray as well. Uh, there is research out there with imidacloprid and Zytec that suggests that it can be applied as a basal systemic bark spray, but it is not labeled for that use on, uh, in, in most states. I should say check with, with your state regulatory department um, if it can be used as a basal systemic bark spray. Uh, Lepitec is labeled only for soil injection, so we can't do sprays with uh, Lepitec uh, and or drenches. Soil injection only with Lepitec. So let's dig into Transtec, which is a dinotephrion formulation. It actually comes in um, really nice water-soluble packets. You mix with water, readily going into solution into your application tanks. Application timing with Transtec, it should be applied when the plant is actively transpiring. Uh, this is a product that's typically applied in early spring and summer. But the nice part about Transtech is that it moves in, it's absorbed by the roots and moves up into the tree in a relatively short amount of time. We can see uh, Transtech moving up into trees in one to two weeks um, on average. Sometimes it can be more depending on tree size, soil moisture, and some of those other factors that we talked about. We've even seen it move into the tree in a matter of days. So this product can be applied more as a just-in-time treatment just prior to the buildup of, um, of pest populations or when these insects are going to be active. Um, Transtech can be timed using growing degree day models or phenological host indicators, uh, which allow practitioners to anticipate pest activity. Um, we can time our treatments uh, using growing degree days, which are commonly um, compiled uh, by a lot of different university extension agencies. And these growing degree days or these host phenological indicators will coincide with specific insect life cycle stages. So if we know that, for example, aphid populations are going to be infesting uh, an oak tree, for example, in the next two to three weeks, we can go out and time our application of Transtec to occur so that the product is up into the tree in uh, toxic, at toxic levels when that insect uh, is going to be feeding. So what allows Transtech to move into trees more rapidly than some of the other insecticides that are available to arborists? Well, it really has to do with uh, two main properties of the active ingredient. Number one, it is much more water soluble than a lot of the other neonicotinoids like imidacloprid, for example. Um, and you can see in the chart on the left that uh, dinotephron is about 80 times more water soluble. So that allows it to uh, be transported throughout the uh, tree much more quickly than something like imidacloprid or propionidin. Furthermore, it is the least likely to get bound up in the soil and bound up in tree tissues as it's being transported up. So it moves into the tree more quickly uh, and can move up uh, more rapidly than these other uh, neonicotinoids. You do need to be a little more careful with this uh, active ingredient if you're working with soils that have less than 2% organic matter or very sandy soils. Um, 
most of our urban soils, if you look at the amount of organic matter that um, is found in soil samples, most urban soils are going to be uh, much higher than 2% and probably an average of about 3% organic matter. <coughs> What does this mean to you? Greater systemic activity, so not only does it move into the plant more quickly, but we can see higher levels of dinotepurine accumulating in the tree leaves and tissues. Uh, faster uptake and translocation equals quicker results. Here's a good example of sycamores that were treated. And these are smaller 15 to 20 foot sycamores that were treated in Florida by Dr. Mizell. And you can see the part per million active ingredient in leaf tissue samples that were collected 7, 30, 60, and 120 days after application. If you compare the two imidacloprid formulations, which is Merit on the left and then Zytec here in the middle, uh, compared to TransTech, you see, number one, that uh, within TransTech we have high parts per million accumulated in the tree uh, within seven days after application, continues to spike. Uh, 30 days um, and then starts to drop off two months and four months after application. But a high, uh, a much higher amount of part per million per, per uh, leaf sample as compared to the imidacloprid treatments as well, which for difficult to control pests or for infested trees, trees that are already being attacked uh, can mean uh, better recovery treatments as compared to imidacloprid, which doesn't get as much insecticide into the tree and it takes longer for the insecticide to, to ramp up in the tree. You look at the spectrum of insects that are controlled by TransTech. The dinotephron is effective on a wide variety of insects, sucking insects like aphids and adelgids, uh, xylem feeding insects. Um, we've got our beetles um, and other plant bugs, mealybugs, leaf hoppers. Uh, so a wide variety of uh, insects that are managed. I'll point your attention to the scale insects here in that uh, both soft and armored scales can be controlled with applications of dinotephron. So that makes this product unique in that because it's soluble it actually moves into some of the plant tissues in those individual cells where armored scales are feeding. We'll talk about that more a few slides, slides later. Uh, we also see good activity against the wood borers, including the flat-headed borers like bronze birch borer and emerald ash borer. It gets basically the same spectrum of insects as imidacloprid. It just moves into the trees much more quickly, a matter of weeks versus months. We had to characterize where we would really um, target the use. What are the best uses for TransTech in our toolbox? we would target these treatments for armored scales, uh, infested trees that are already being attacked by insects. We need fast knockdown treatment with the soil application. We're looking for a, uh, a good recovery treatment. If you're dealing with early season insects, and because the product moves up much more quickly into the tree, if you have early feeding insects, um, imidacloprid may not be an option because it's going to take longer to get up into the tree and provide efficacy. So you can apply something like TransTech, which will take a matter of a couple of weeks and can get into the tree very rapidly. Areas with less soil moisture, so we're seeing more folks in dry, arid areas because of the increased solubility, uh, more use of dinotephuron uh, because it can get into the tree more readily, whereas imidacloprid may not move into the tree as quickly uh, in some of these dry, area, dry arid areas. And that's not to say that dinotephuron doesn't need any soil moisture. It just can get by with less soil moisture than, say, something like propionidin or imidacloprid. Certainly situations where fast activity is needed. Here is a research, some research trial results from a uh, project that we're doing uh, in a suburb of Chicago, uh, Hazelcrest. You can see that TransTech spring applications, these were made in late April, early May annually, starting in 2008 uh, through 2012, provided a high level of control against emerald ash borer. Um, and in this area here, you can see that the blue line, which represents our untreated control ash trees, um, really ramped up uh, with emerald ash borer from 2010 to 2012. 
Uh, we've continued to monitor this site. All of the uh, untreated, untreated control ashtrays are now dead or have been removed. And most of the treatments here, including the Transtech spring application, have provided uh, control of, of greater than uh, of less than 20 percent uh, crown thinning and dieback, which is a good result as it relates to emerald ash borer. <clears throat> Here's some of the photos from this project. Um, you can see on the left here the spring transtech application. That tree is looking great as compared to the untreated control. Um, one thing to note, uh, transtech, in this experiment we wanted to look at would fall applications of transtech be effective against emerald ash borer. Uh, we see fall applications of Zytec or Imidacloprid being done on a lot of different insects, including emerald ash borer. And fall transtech, however, is not an effective treatment for emerald ash borer. We don't recommend applying transtech in the fall of the year for deciduous trees that lose their leaves. It doesn't have enough residual in the soil to last as a fall treatment for subsequent control the following year, like you would see with Imidacloprid. Here's some data on wax scale. So this is a soft scale. You can see Transtech performed very well, similar to Safari, which is also a dinotephiron treatment, and actually trended to perform a little bit better on this uh, soft scale than Imidacloprid in this case. Some data on hemlock woolly adelogid, and uh, Transtech is widely used for hemlocks, especially trees that are currently infested if you need rapid control with hemlock woolly adelgid and you don't want to wait for midacloprid to be translocated into some of these large hemlocks, you can achieve a very high level of control. Uh, and a lot of arborists actually will go out, if it's a heavy population of HWA, especially on large trees, they may go out um, and treat it both at the same time with Transtech and Zytec uh, on infested trees to get good recovery treatment and then longer residual with the Zytec as a combination treatments on large hemlocks. But you can see even with Transtech as a standalone treatment, very high uh, levels of control on hemlock woolly adelgid. And furthermore, because it does provide efficacy against armored scales, we actually see efficacy on elongate hemlock scale as well as HWA. So you can kill two birds with one stone. Now one thing I'll mention about dinotephiron, because you'll hear about this with the midacloprid, there are, to date have been no reports with dinotephiron and Transtech causing mite flare-ups. And oftentimes we'll see this um, with the midacloprid, especially on trees that are susceptible to spider mites. Um, and there's a few different reasons why this might be occurring, but a midacloprid can either enhance the health of trees, making it a uh, better position for mite attacks, um, or it can speed up the reproductive uh, abilities of mites to the point where you see more mite populations. And or a third philosophy or a hypothesis, I guess, is that you may actually be um, killing off some of the predators to mites when you're making a midacloprid application. So we actually have, we haven't seen this with Transtech. Uh, we've actually documented now in one research trial where we've seen flare-ups with mites with the midacloprid, but we didn't see it with thanotephiron. This was done at uh, Purdue University with Dr. Cliff Sadoff in a calico scale trial. So it's something that um, if you do have species that you've treated with the midacloprid and you've noted the mite flare-ups, you may be able to minimize or reduce this moving to transtech. Soft scales versus armored scales. We're not going to get into a lot on scale biology today, but I wanted to bring this up in our Transtech conversation because this is the one soil applied product where you can see effectiveness both on the soft scales, which are feeding on the phloem. These are produced honeydew, and a lot of times the honeydew can be a nuisance getting on patios or decks and cause more of an issue to your customers than what maybe the plant damage is that they're aware of. Um, Versus the armored scales, which do not produce honeydew. Uh, typically, they have a hard covered uh, shell. Uh, these scales are feeding dip deeper into individual cells in the palisade layer. Um, and it's thought that imidacloprid does not move into these cells where these armored scales are feeding, whereas dinotephiron does. So we pick up a spectrum of activity on some of these armored scales uh, that we can see effectiveness on. 
So again, here's data on TransTech with wax scale, soft scale, very effective on that particular scale. Um, if you look at some of the armored scales for which we have data on TransTech, common scales would be oyster shell, pine needle scale, euonymus scale, false oleander scale, elongate hemlock scale. Uh, we've got good research that shows TransTech can be effective on these uh, different armored scales. Here you can see on the right a TransTech treated magnolia that has uh, that was in, that was being attacked by false oleander scale armored scale on uh, magnolia on the left is the untreated plants clean them right up pine needle scale very common armored scale across a lot of parts of the country transtech really smokes both the adults and the nymphs uh, both a soil application or a basal systemic bark spray it can be quite effective when applied in uh, mid to late spring. These treatments were done in Ohio and the applications were done in May, mid-May. And you can see a very high level of control on pine needle steel with transtech. We've done additional trials on cryptomeria, aspen scale, uh, Japanese maple scale, where we've got good data that shows transtech can be effective. There are a few armored scales that, at least to date, we either need more research or we need to look at rates timing where it has not been effective. And this is primarily those bark feeding armored scales like peach scale, gloomy scale, obscure scale, where these soil applications are not as effective as uh, what we're seeing on some of the other armored scale species that might be feeding on the foliage or the needles. Uh, on trees. So more research is being done to look at these difficult to control scale species. Let's talk about Lepitec now. Uh, Lepitec also moves into the tree very rapidly, a matter of one to two weeks, um, and in some cases we can see it moving in in a matter of days. Very water soluble, so this product will accumulate at high levels in the leaves of trees. Um, applications again should be made to actively growing plants. Um, you don't want to, again, like TransTech, fall applications for subsequent control of the next year, like we see with the metoclopid, uh, will not work with Lepitec here. And because of the um, rapid movements in trees, again, we can use the growing degree days or the host phenological indicators to uh, time our applications here. And this is, so for example, if you have gypsy moth feeding, we know we want to control the early end star stages of that insect. Um, you want to time your application so that you have some leaf transpiration um, as well as it's going inside with that early end star stage. So treating with Lepitec when the oaks or the trees are about half to three-quarter three quarter leaf emergence is a good application timing with Lepitec. The product does not have as much residual in the soil or residual efficacy. You're looking at about 30 to 45 days of residual control, making timing very important with Lepitec. It has less residual than even TransTech. Some of the key uses for Lepitec, so this is the only soil applied product that will allow you to achieve predictable control against caterpillars and mites. So Rainbow developed a full EPA label for this to allow arborists to treat both caterpillars and mites as a soil application. And this has really opened up uh, a good operationally efficient way to treat uh, those two categories of tree pests. In addition, Lepitec will also work on a wide variety of other leaf feeding insects, including aphids, Japanese beetles, and other uh, leaf feeding insects. Here's some of our research on little leaf linden with Japanese beetle. You can see a high level of control. Uh, the treated tree here on the left versus the untreated plant uh, in the middle and on the right. Much more defoliation noted from Japanese beetle. Bagworm, which is a very common insect that arborists are treating with Lepitec. Treatments um, that can be made in late May, June prior to these insects beginning to feed on the leaves can be very uh, effective and achieve a high level of control on bagworms, which attack a variety of different tree species. Lepitec is a great option. We have uh, information and data on spruce spider mites. And uh, you can see here that a one-time soil injection treatment of Lepitec 
performed as well as Lucid, which is abamectin, and a 1% oil oil, or another common applied mitocyte called Forbid. So Lepitec in this particular trial is providing as good a results on spruce spider mite as the two spray treatments. We also see um, uh, that that held up uh, 40 days after application. So the key here was to time the Lepitec treatment prior to the mite populations growing. And if you do that, a one-time application of Lepitec could provide a high level of control. For some caterpillars and mite species, especially if you have a high initial outbreak, you may have to make a second repeat application. And we recommend that you do that 30 days after the first application. One neat uh, trial uh, that we did was on gouty oak gall. There's a number of these leaf-feeding gall insects or mites that are very challenging for insect, for arborists to uh, manage. And in this situation on swamp white oaks, we're able to achieve a fairly decent level of control on gouty oak gall. I would preface this that this was on smaller trees. On larger trees, we noted that we had to treat trees for at least a two or three year period before we were able to clean those trees up using soil applications of Lepitec. So I think there's some promise for things like gouty oak gall, horned oak gall, with uh, treatments that are timed just prior to when the leaf uh, feeding stage of these insects or mites might occur. Let's finish up here with Zytec in the last few minutes and then we'll take questions. Zytec is uh, metacropid, as I mentioned earlier, comes in a liquid and a water-soluble packet formulation. Timing of Zytec, because it does take longer to be absorbed into the roots and move into the tree due to its water solubility and its binding affinity for uh, the soil and tree tissues, you need to time these applications to occur 30 to 60 days prior to the anticipated pest feeding. And so this is a treatment that typically is done preventatively. Um, the nice part about Zytec is that it does have a much longer residual in the soil. And this allows us to not only make spring applications, but we can make applications in the fall that will uh, provide efficacy on a number of insects the following season. Vitaclopid is uh, still the most widely used active ingredient in our industry. Um, as I mentioned before, it really revolutionized the way that we can treat uh, insects in urban areas. It's got a broad spectrum of insects that can be controlled. Much like Transtech, you can pull in the sucking insects, some of the leaf defoliators, uh, leaf beetles, sawflies, leaf miners, and then a lot of the same bores that Thanoteptron works as well on. It does not work on armored scales, and it does not work on caterpillars or mites. So just a quick example of when you're looking at different products, maybe something that you want to look at. When we look at Zytec and the, how quickly it moves into the tree, as I mentioned, here's a real world example of a treatment on emerald ash borer. If you look at the application timing, Zytec in most parts of the country, we have to get our Zytec treatments down in late April, early May, so that they can be absorbed and moved up into the tree to prevent uh, both adults and larvae from feeding on ash trees. And so our, our timing is really in the early spring of the year. With TransTech, we have more flexibility again because it's moving into the tree in a, in a much more rapidly. We can actually extend out our application season into May, June, and even see some results from July and early August applications to prevent the larvae on emerald ash borer from feeding inside the tree. Um, and so knowing the product and basing the, uh, the, your treatment choice on, number one, is it effective against the insect, but also trying to fit it into your operations, the equipment that you use, and the application timing that you have. Something like Zytec coincides with a lot of your spring fungicide sprays and uh, other applications that you're doing in the spring. And to get all of that done in an in efficient in on-time manner can be challenging. So something like TransTech can give you more flexibility. Some of the limitations or things that you also need to know about that are more challenging with these soil applied products is the use rate per acre limits. All of them have use rate per acre limits that limit the amount of product that you can apply per acre per year. Um, you want to know what those are on the label. You also want to know how 
the uh, regulatory agencies in each of your state interpret your use rate per acre limits. Some of them have different ways in which they interpret that that you want to be familiar with. Uh, other concerns certainly with the neonicotinoids especially is around pollinators and their impact on pollinators. Do these products move into the flowers and the pollen at high enough levels to cause impacts on pollinators? And we're still learning more about this. I think you know there's a lot of good research out there that suggests that if anything, maybe sublethal doses are found present in some of these flowering trees. So as a, as a best practice, we want to use these uh, products judiciously at the correct dosage rates, timing, and we want to make sure that we are minimizing the use on flowering tree species uh, such as tulip poplar. Um, note that with thanotephrion and imidacloprid, most product labels now will prohibit you from making applications to flowering linden. And so that, that really makes it more challenging to treat things like Japanese beetle with imidacloprid or dinotephrion. So uh, a couple of the things to avoid, um, you know, also avoid soil treating trees that may have flowering plants that are within the treatment zone, one to two feet away from the base of the tree. And then also remember that it's not an issue on our wind pollinated tree species like ash, hemlock, and a number of other uh, trees where you're treating them. That brings into play another way in which you can use Lepitec or even Transtec for that matter. Because they move into the tree much more rapidly, you can treat with Lepitec uh, right after petal drop or after flowering with things like um, Japanese beetle on flowering linden. So you can time the application to occur after flower uh, after flowering has occurred and because it moves much more quickly up into the tree you have a soil applied option um, versus using imidacloprid um, and uh, dinotephrion, uh, for example. So with that I will take some questions. We do have some additional upcoming webinars over the next few days here. Uh, one is on that very topic of pollinators and plant health care which is tomorrow uh, which Kent will do a great job with. We've got downloadable apps for tree care professionals and then best management practices for tree injection coming up in the next few days. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me via email or uh, you have my phone number there. And as mentioned earlier in the webinar, this will be, be uh, placed on our website at www.treecarescience.com if you want to download the webinar for future use, both the slides and the audio. So with that, we've got um, a few minutes for questions here. I'll also stay on if there's a, a number of questions that would push me uh, past the, the uh, top of the hour here. We can get all those addressed. You're more than welcome to stay on if you'd like to. Very good. Peter is helping me get orientated with questions here. Um, so Garrett, Curates Backpack Soil Injector, what's your opinion on this device? So the Curates is an older Japanese uh, soil injection system. As I mentioned in the presentation, this delivers about one ounce of ready-to-use mixed solution per inch of DBH. I think it's a, a good system if you're uh, in a situation where you, you can't um, mix up a large volume of water. If you're doing remote applications in some mountainous areas, or other areas like that for maybe hemlock woolly adelgid. This could be a system that you look at using. I would say, um, I know there is research out there that shows effectiveness of uh, this system. From the standpoint of the lower water volume that you're applying, my one concern would be, are we applying enough mixed solution to the root zone to encourage uptake and absorption into roots, especially in drier situations where you may want to apply a little bit more water at the time of application. But there is data out there that does show it's effective. Um, I think for large scale 
be used for doing soil injections, I would probably move more to the HTI or using the hydraulic soil injection system. It's more operationally efficient, not having to mix as often. So, um, do I recommend treating in the fall with Transtech for various insects such as elongate hemlock scale and hemlock woolly adelgid with um, Transtech? So, one thing that this is a great question because uh, for conifers such as pines and hemlocks that retain their needles, you can make applications in the fall if you have different leaf feeding insects like hemlock woolly adelgid which will produce a second brood of insects in the fall. Um, so you can make an application at that point in time and because those needles are retained, the dinotephron actually uh, is retained in the needles and leaves. Um, I would base my application on, you know, for example, if you get out to the customer's property for the first time, maybe in late summer, and you haven't made an application, it certainly would be appropriate to make a treatment at that time for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, in elongate hemlock scale, typically if I'm only going to make one application per year, I'm going to time that in late spring, early summer. Um, but that can be one where applicators are making um, an application in the fall as well. I know we're running out of time here. Feel free to stay on if you'd like to. We've got a few other questions. What did you say the residual time for Transtech is? We have in trials seen that that can peak in the plant in about 60 to 90 days and then will begin to drop off after that. Uh, certainly a well-timed Transtech application will provide you season-long control of most insects. Um, but we see it peaking in about anywhere from 60 to 90 days um, and then dropping off after that. Can basal soil drench be used for shrubs? Absolutely. You can drench shrubs using the Transtech and Zytec. Um, the rates are actually based on the feet of shrub height that you're treating. And basal soil drench is a good way in which you can treat shrubs by applying the solution right at the base where the stems come out. So it is a, an application that you can use on, on shrubs. What, rec what would you recommend to control for overwintering nymphs of magnolia scale this spring? Well, the magnolia scale uh, crawlers are actually out in uh, later in the season, July, August, depending on where you're at in the country. And so if you're making soil applied systemic applications, you want to time those treatments so that they are going to be in the plant later in the summer. So if you're looking at a spring application, what I would recommend is using some type of a cover spray, such as you can use your horticultural oil, or you can use a, a, a broad spectrum insecticide um, and, and move towards your systemic treatments later in the summer, as I mentioned, so that the products are up in the tree prior to the crawlers feeding on the leaves. In a lot of cases, we've noted with magnolia scale, which can be a, a very difficult to control scale insect. That's a soft scale. Some of our arborists here uh, that we work with locally and then in, across the country, in the first year, of treatment, if you have high magnolia scale populations, they've actually went to a combination approach where they're using both some type of a cover sp spray treatments, either in the spring or crawler stage spray in late summer, and then combining that with systemic applications to really knock back the population in year one, and then uh, looking more towards maybe more of a maintenance treatments of the systemic applications in year two. Could I show the use rates per acre slide again? That's something that I can make available, John, uh, to you with your question there. That's also available on all of the different labels, but I'll send that off to you so you have that. Um, and again, all of a lot of the states interpret what an acre is per year differently, and so that's something that you want to check on. I know that the EPA is also looking at uh, providing more label language on some of these soil applied products to streamline that, make that more consistent. Will Lepitec work on eriophyid mites? You know, we haven't done uh, research on eriophyid mites such as the rust mites. Um, anecdotally, I can tell you that arborists have tried Lepitec on eriophyid mites such as hemlock rust mite. They have noted some reduction 
in hemlock rust mite. The specific um, mite that you're talking about here in viburnum, I don't know if it will provide effectiveness. One thing I'll mention too with Lepitex specifically, we haven't worked out the dosage rates for shrubs uh, like we have with the TransTech and the Zytec. We're working on that now, but certainly um, we don't have a dosage rate or a dilution rate that we've worked out for treating shrubs with Lepitex. So that's something to be aware of. Can you achieve multiple years of control with hemlock woolly adelgid with the midacloprid. This is certainly something that's been documented. I know uh, Dr. Rich Coles and his research team out east have documented multi-year control with the midacloprid. And it really depends on the size of tree, the soil moisture, and uh, the level of, of insect population as it relates to how many years of control you can see. I know at some of the higher rates of the midacloprid, two, three years of um, protection is not unheard of with things like woolly adelgid. Now, the question I would have there, is it that the insecticide is actually continuing to be present in the trees um, and being effective, or is it that the insect populations also take time to build up? Probably a little bit of both as it relates to the metacloprid and hemlock woolly adelgid treatments on hemlocks. Remember, again, hemlock needles will retain the insecticide for a much longer period of time and can retain it over multiple seasons. Unlike deciduous trees, when they drop their leaves, uh, the insecticide um, isn't going to be present. So for things like um, you know, leaf feeding insects and deciduous trees, they're going to require an annual treatment. Okay, those are the questions that we have here today. I appreciate everybody's time and uh, uh, involvement in the webinar. If you have any additional questions, feel free to contact Rainbow, and have a great day.